hello for everyone joining us. We're just waiting a few minutes uh, to, let, uh, to allow attendees to come and enter the room before we kick off this conversation. All right, good afternoon and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you're joining us from around the world today. Welcome to the Arab News Research and Studies Briefing Room webinar titled Breaking Down the Eastern Mediterranean Crisis, part of Arab News' coverage of the bicentennial of the 1821 Greek Revolution. Now, today's crucial conversation brings with it an impressive panelist lineup. Joining us will be the Greek ambassador to Saudi Arabia, his Excellency uh, Ambassador Alexis Constantopoulos. Also with us are Laurie Haitayan, Hait the Middle East and North Africa Director at the Natural Resource Governance Institute and an oil and gas governance and geopolitics expert, as well as Alexandros Zachariadis, the Head of Research for 89 London, an LSE-based think tank, and an expert on foreign policy of Greece and Cyprus in the Middle East with a particular interest in the Eastern Mediterranean. Now we're aiming to have a 30 minute conversation with our guests and we'll allocate a further 15 to 20 minutes afterwards for questions from the audience. Please do use the Q&A function found on your screens below to submit your questions. We really do hope to answer all the questions but given the time constraints, we can't guarantee that all of them will go through. Now my name is Tari Ali Ahmed. I am the head of the Arab News Research and Studies Unit and your moderator for today's crucial and important discussion. And now, without further ado, I would love to kick off this conversation with Ambassador Constantopoulos. Please, can you kick us off by giving us your, your and the Greek perspective on what is going on in the Eastern Mediterranean? Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. Thank you for, um, thanks to Alexandros and to Lori. Thank you for uh, putting all this together and for having a discussion on the Eastern Mediterranean, which is a, an extremely important issue especially nowadays, it has always been, but I think it's even a very extremely timely discussions given its importance. So I will provide you with the Greek perspective and uh, I'm happy to do that. And uh, let's start immediately. So what I would like to say is that Greece is a very positive uh, factor in, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, it seeks to promote dialogue and cooperation, of course, through good neighborly relations to secure peace, to promote security and prosperity also in the Eastern Mediterranean. To this end, Greece has recently signed several maritime delimitation agreements that have been concluded in the framework of international law and in international law of the sea, and that also abide by the rules of good neighborly relations. These agreements reconfirm and enshrine the effects and the right of our islands to a continental shelf and an exclusive economic zone. Uh, in June of last year in Athens, Greece signed the, the agreement on the delimitation of maritime zones with Italy um, in, uh, within the framework of UNCLOS and as well as the 1977 agreement of the median line between Greece and Italy for the delimitation of the Greek Italian continental shelf. In August of the same year, last year in Cairo, we signed the agreement for delimitation of maritime zones with Egypt, which was a very important milestone also. And, and with Albania, uh, we're taking the issue of maritime jurisdiction zones to The Hague. So uh, the issue will be discussed there. So um, Greece will in the future continue to act with the same result to, with the goal of delimitating maritime zones with all our neighboring countries, but always in the same framework, the provisions of international law and the law of the sea. Uh, which we all know reflect customary law in its entity and not selectively or arbitrar arbitrarily, and it also provides all the necessary tools for this purpose. 
uh, delimitation, as we all understand, cannot be achieved through null and void agreements or through the unilateral submission of uh, coordinates. Now, these are our are, 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 are recent actions. Uh, our uh, position has been consistent throughout the age uh, of adherence to international law, and it's not going to change in the future. And I think that uh, it's very important to bear this in mind because uh, this is the cornerstone of our policy uh, bilaterally and also multinationally, and it's a very important factor. Now, we all see that there have been very important um, uh, oil and gas developments in the Eastern Mediterranean recently. So Greece's position is very clear. Greece promotes energy cooperation among the countries of the Eastern Mediterranean region and those of the Middle East, uh, either at trilateral or also at a multilateral level, uh, as was confirmed at the recent Philia Forum that was held uh, in Greece uh, recently on, on uh, February 11. Uh, we consider that the discovery and future uh, exploitation of these new energy sources are of vital importance for the stability of the region and can actively contribute to regional cooperation also in line with the EU's energy diversification strategy. On the East Med gas pipeline, Greece is, is promoting energy connectivity with the newly discovered uh, gas fields in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, we are working for the realization of the East Med gas pipeline that will be linking uh, Israel, Cyprus, Egypt's offshore natural gas reserves, reserves through Greece to Italy and the, all the other European countries. So um, this, this is why we, are, we, we ha are very important that Greece is one of the founding members of the new regional international organization, the East Mediterranean Gas Forum. The recent signing of its status by all seven founding members and already ratification six out of seven proves that energy can be used as a catalyst for peace and close cooperation among Eastern Mediterranean countries. We also uh, look forward to welcoming other uh, European countries. And we consider that the organization, the East Mediterranean Gas Forum, is open to all countries of the region that respect the provisions of international law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, Laurie, I noticed that you had some slight electricity troubles given that you're in Lebanon. Uh, I'm glad Thanks. to see that electricity is back up and running. Uh, could you care please to comment on what the Ambassador said as well as give your own insight into what's going on in the region? Uh, definitely, thank you, Tare, and thank you for uh, the Ambassador for putting the, shedding the light on the most important issues that I think uh, that are happening, uh, the dynamics in the Eastern Mediterranean. So I guess I agree with him on the first one that the main issue, uh, that uh, the main uh, complex, uh, com the most complex issue is the maritime border issue, not only between uh, Turkey and Greece, uh, but uh, between many different countries. And as you know, uh, for instance, in Lebanon, we started, we relaunched a negotiation, an indirect negotiation between Lebanon and Israel on a maritime border that had been contested for 10 years and under the US uh, uh, mediation. Uh, now it stopped, but we uh, hopefully that this will continue. On the other side as well, uh, you know that uh, there we have the same problem uh, with Syria. Again, Syria uh, do, uh, hasn't delimit uh, doesn't have a de delimitation of its borders, but the blocks that it has divided, the, uh, there is a kind of overlap uh, with the uh, Lebanon uh, EEZ. So these are just like so examples to say that in the East Mediterranean, you have some countries that are signatories to the UNCLOS and they believe that any delimitation should be according to the UNCLOS and you have others that are not signatory to the UNCLOS. They, may, they might have different interpretations of it. And this is, uh, this is creating one important challenge to the Eastern Mediterranean collaboration on different issues, not only on uh, security or politics, but as well, it is affecting the oil and gas sector. And I'm sure we will discuss that later. But this was one, uh, one kind of, uh, um, uh, of remark to make. The other point, I guess, that I would want to add to what the uh, ambassador said, that this new dimension of the Russian presence in the Eastern Mediterranean. So this is adding another complexity to the region having Russian naval bases on 
the shores of Syria and Tartus is not making a lot of countries happy. So you have the NATO countries that are not very happy to see a Russian Navy being that close to them. Uh, Israel even is not very happy with that presence because Israel had like kind of this was the background where they were like ha they were easy in uh, in different activities known or unknown. So now you have this Russian presence, which is a bit of uh, uh, creating annoyance. So it is important to really look at this situation and and uh, keep it on, uh, on the radar to see how this interaction will be uh, will be developing. Um, I, I, so these are, I think, like two uh, two main uh, issues that I wanted to highlight, and definitely the uh, infrastructure collaboration on related to oil and gas. And the ambassador again mentioned the East Gas Pipeline. We can discuss that uh, in, a, in a later on the importance of oil and gas and the need for common infrastructure and how this East Med Gas Forum will be playing that role. So I think I can keep it for later on, but this, these were like my first reactions to what the ambassador said. There is a lot of potential in the East Mediterranean, but at the same time, we have a lot of problems and complexities that we need to deal with all together and not like alienating parties against parties or playing these divisive cards. Thank you very much, Laurie, for these comments. Uh, Alexander, please, can you care to comment? Yes, um, initially I would like to thank uh, Tarek and Arab News for having me here and uh, the distinguished panel. Now, um, just to, to build on, on, on what the ambassador said, as we know, in last summer, in August, September and October uh, of 2020, uh, Greece and Turkey had one of their most um, uneasy periods of the last 20 years. I mean, people familiar with Greco-Turkish relations, they know that since the end of the 1990s, when we had the sort of earthquake diplomacy between the two sides, Greece and Turkey were able to enjoy a period of the tent, which uh, after the inability to solve the Cyprus problem in 2004 and to actually create uh, a pave way for Turkish participation in the EU, those, <clears throat> those relations were becoming all increasingly uneasy. And Part of that was uh, the situation unfolding in Turkey, where you had a more authoritarian turn by President Erdogan, and which also coincided with the regional developments in the Eastern Mediterranean, which obviously one is the hydrocarbon discoveries that both um, the ambassador and Lori have already mentioned, but also um, the, the, the withdrawal of American uh, presence in the region, uh, especially after the Obama administration, and especially after the Trump administration, we have seen a process of which American power has been withdrawing from the region that has created a vacuum uh, that also coincides with the Russian presence that Lori has mentioned, but also with the assertiveness that states like Iran or Turkey and France uh, more recently have um, enjoyed in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean and in, which is essentially an attempt to fill the vacuum that the U.S. has left. Um, now, my personal uh, position here is that, especially with the Greco-Turkish confrontation in line, uh, in mind, um, it is key to have the U.S. back in the region in some sort of, in some form of a role. The reason, the rationale for this is because currently, like and luckily, Greece and Turkey are talking to each other, uh, but. The, the issue is that, at least to my understanding, the current, uh, the 61st and the 62nd round of exploratory negotiations are having the two sides talking, meaning that the tensions are low, but I don't think that they will create any sort of, of, uh, of um, breakthrough in, uh, in solving the maritime dispute issues that Greece and Turkey have since the 1970s. And building on that, uh, I feel like uh, the United States are right now the only side that can keep those uh, two sides talking while also uh, pushing them to find a solution in another important issue, which is far closer to a solution than the maritime disputes, which is the Cyprus problem. And there are, there are developments within the next couple of months and a solution there would be uh, very important in, in creating some, some sort of... Uh, some, providing some fuel to EU-Turkey negotiations, 
uh, especially at the current point where Turkey is at an economic, uh, you know, at the, having has to deal with the crash of the lira and the, an ongoing economic crisis, and at the same time provide a further impetus for another round of the time that will give a time to both Greece and Turkey to solve their internal disputes. I'll leave it at that at this point in time. Thank you very much, Alexandros. Um, given that, uh, Ambassador, I'd like to turn to you with a question. So obviously, uh, whenever each one of you spoke, Turkey is dominantly the elephant in the room. And I wanted to ask you, can you tell us a bit more about Turkey's actions within and its involvement in the region, in the Mediterranean? Yes. Um... Yes, with pleasure, since you're asking me, uh, I will. Uh, I think it's very important to understand that given the importance of mineral resources of oil and gas, uh, this is really at, at the core of, our, of, uh, of Turkey's actions. Uh, as Alexandro said, uh, um, during the summer, uh, especially during the summer of the last year, the escalation was, uh, we've never had in history such a long period of highly tense relations with Turkey. But Greece has always been responding methodically to these provocations. International law has have always determined uh, the uh, determined the red lines, and these are the red lines that will be respected also in the future. Now, I don't want to get into too much details, but just to give you a very brief outline uh, on what uh, Alexandros was saying. So we've seen uh, from July to November of last year that the uh, the Turkish Petroleum Company has been issuing, uh, uh, you know, illegal um, seismic researchers with the, the, the oceanographic vessel, the Oruçre, which was usually accompanied by military vessels. And then uh, the permits they were giving to the Turkish Petroleum Company to uh, do fossil fuel researches also in the Greek continental shelf. Uh, in... <clears throat> October of last year, there was also an illegal extension, uh, unilateral extension of the, of the search and uh, rescue area that was declared by the Turks in, in areas of Greek competence. Uh, then we also remember the very dramatic last year in March that there was an uh, instrumentalization of migrants that by busloads were, were uh, 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 you know, were hushed into the, the borders with Greece to illegal uh, cross the, the border in Evos. And there's also a lot of support for uh, illegal crossing of Greek sea boundaries. We've also seen violations of the Greek national uh, airspace. Uh, we've seen also that Turkey or Turkish officials have done several uh, statements on challenging international treaties, such as the Treaty of Lausanne. And we also saw, uh, last but not least, the transformation of the uh, landmark World Cultural Heritage Site uh, Museum, Saint Sophia, into a mosque, as well as the Carrier, uh, Carrier Museum. So we see these actions, we see these claims, we stick to international law, we abide by our principal position, and uh, we are, are, the, those are going to be our red lines. But Notwithstanding what is happening, Greece has always supported talks with Turkey to settle the unique difference there is, i.e. the delimitation of the continental shelf and the exclusive economic zone in the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean. The holding of dialogue, uh, nevertheless, <laughs> requires de-escalation and restrain from thre threatening actions consistently and on, the, on a long period as well as commitment to full compliance with international law and the principle of good neighborly relations. So um, we have uh, uh, reinitiated uh, bilateral exploratory talks that had been um, stopped, paused in, in 2016. Uh, as uh, Alexandros knows, the 61st round took place in Istanbul on the 25th of January. The 62nd round took place in Athens on the 16th of uh, March. And on the 17th of March, we also had the, our uh, bilateral political consultations. And uh, our Minister of Foreign Affairs within this framework will also be meeting his counterpart in Ankara on the 14th of April. So there's dialogue to come. But the issue of uh, Turkey has been dealt, as you know, as uh, Greece is part of the EU and Greece is the, are the 
most eastern borders of the EU uh, within the framework of the European Union. So we recently had on Monday the, the, the March Foreign Affairs Council, where the ministers assessed um, the European Union Turkish relations in view of the joint report that, would pre that was prepared by the EU and that will be the base for the debate that will take place uh, on the 25th. So tomorrow, uh, tomorrow by the heads of states and government. Uh, of the EU. Um, as the, the report recognizes, um, since December of last year, we have seen some signs in the right direction and some step, steps towards de-escalation, uh, but um, uh, Turkish, uh, still the process of de-escalation in the Eastern Mediterranean remains fragile and de-escalation efforts need to be sustained. So um, we, we will have tomorrow the European Council uh, to, uh, and it will be up to the European Council to adopt uh, um, the, 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 the decisions, conclusions about the report that has been elaborated by Turkey. Thank you. I've been a bit long. I'm sorry. It was not my intention. And I just wanted to be as factual as, as, as possible. Thank you. No worries. Thank you very much for being detailed and, uh, and factual, as you said. Um, Lori, uh, your work and experience in the oil and gas industry comes at a really pivotal time in the Mediterranean. We know both the Eastern Mediterranean crisis is going on and unfolding, as well as the Lebanese is really maritime border demarcations causing a Lebanese headache um, when we know that it was promised to be a gas producing country. Now we find ourselves without electricity. Now we see the Eastern Mediterranean gas forum forming and turning into more of a political alliance than an energy one. Uh, can you please comment uh, on this and go in depth about why is that the case and what are we to expect from this forum? Yes, uh, thank you. So uh, one uh, one important issue, like just to, uh, to continue on what the ambassador was saying about Turkey's uh, change, maybe change in politics. We know what Turkey has done under, when uh, uh, President Trump uh, was in power. And it was a very hawkish attitude, a very, uh, very aggressive uh, uh, attitude toward in the Eastern Mediterranean. And now we see that there might be a change in tactics uh, by the Turks now that the Biden administration is uh, in place and it's more critical. Uh, and there are no more phone conversations, daily phone conversations between the U.S. president and the Turkish president. So we see that they are starting kind of to change tactics. So now there is this kind of a rapprochement with the Egypt, like uh, uh, kind of uh, being more uh, critical of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood in Turkey, uh, um, uh, sending uh, signals to the Israelis, uh, maybe send, uh, sending uh, 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 signals to the to the to the Greek uh, to the Greeks. So I think what Turkey now is trying to do is like knowing that there is a more critical administration, uh, uh, U.S. administration, trying now to test how strong the East Med Gas Forum coalition is, trying to go and uh, hit on uh, individual states and offering them things that might be interesting to these countries to see how this East Med Gas Forum is really, is really strong. Because for, uh, to go back to your question, Tarek, because uh, for Turkey, for sure, the East Med Gas Forum is seen as a political entity against the, the Turkish ambition in the, uh, in the region and the gas Turkish ambition and oil and gas in the region. And definitely all the member states have denied that claim saying that this is not a political uh, uh, gathering, uh, at least it is not against uh, Turkey. But, uh, and this is, a, this is a more of a uh, economic uh, uh, platform. So on that, uh, I'll go back to the economic value because true, it should be an economic platform. But what we've seen that uh, what happened lately in the last meeting of the uh, East Med Gas Forum members and at the ministerial level, we've heard about this incident, the veto incident, as I call it, where the Palestinian representative or the minister vetoed the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the UAE's uh, 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 ask to become a member of the uh, East Med Gas Forum. This was over, uh, uh, if you want, this incident was overshadowed by other good news that were happening in the region, uh, being it like this uh, new Israeli Cyprus deal on the Aphrodite uh, field, being it this, gas, uh, this uh, Gaza marine development, being it the Leviathan 
pipeline going through, LN, uh, through the LNG plants in Egypt. All of these the developments overshadowed this political incident. But if this incident continues, and if this, and why the, the Palestinians vetoed it, vetoed UAE's adherence, it's because of UAE's uh, peace uh, deal with, with uh, Israel. So if this incident is, is uh, continues, or this mentality of using the platform for, for political scoring, automatically the East Med Gas Forum would lose its economic value. Because there is, so the other point is like, there is an economic value for the East Mediterranean Gas Forum, for sure. Because the demand, uh, for sure, it, it, like, first of all, it is a regional platform. And we should take it as a regional platform where it will cater for the regional need, for the regional uh, market. So the demand in the region, at least for the seven countries, the demand for gas is increasing and it will continue on increasing from 0.3 TCF per, uh, per month to 0.6 TCF per month. The supply from the region is not increasing, so it needs to increase. Therefore, the, uh, the use of this platform to increase supply from the region and work together as one in the region, being it an infrastructure, uh, 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 building common infrastructures, uh, being like having uh, common policies around oil and gas, this is great and has value so that the supply is increased so that it caters for the regional need. Therefore, uh, for that reason, I guess, what we are seeing when you see that uh, uh, Leviathan or, or the owners of Leviathan are thinking of a pipeline from Leviathan, the Israeli field, to the Egyptian LNG plant, uh, that is a sign of how these companies, at least the com on the company level, they want to link the region, the markets together. So, may, so for that end, what I see, and this is like on the East Met pipeline, because there was there were a lot of discussions about the East Met pipeline, and we we all think that the East Met pipeline will will not become a reality. But on the but there are other uh, there are other alternatives to connect the markets in the region. So one alternative would be the Leviathan pipeline to the LNG plants in Egypt. Yes, the other the other one would be to build a pipeline from uh, Cyprus to the LNG plants in uh, Egypt, and then in, so, so if we're if we're uh, concentrating the efforts on LNG, therefore Greece could become the market as well for LNG. As we know, like L Greece is an important uh, has important plants and to uh, to uh, to absorb this LNG, and they could be the the the, the door to the uh, to the to uh, Eastern uh, Europe if you want. So there is this, there are these synergies that are there, they are real for the East Med Gas Forum, but the risk is that East Med Gas Forum is used for politics. If they will use it for political gains or for political uh, wh whatever as a political tool, the East Med Gas Forum will lose its uh, value and it has a great, great potential value. So I think what should be done, and this is my last point, what should be done is uh, definitely a discussion should happen around the region on the maritime borders because as I said everybody has a problem with maritime borders which is directly uh, uh, linked to the uh, to the oil and gas development uh, and then uh, try to see how to bring on board uh, Turkey uh, to the East Med Gas Forum because I think then uh, I don't know what will happen to Syria if Syria would want to join as well uh, for Lebanon, for now, we think that L Lebanon doesn't want to join, but maybe the, later the developments with the political developments will change, uh, depending on, uh, on, the, uh, on the developments in Syria as well, maybe it would change and everybody will be joining the East Med Gas Forum because this is a very valuable forum for the, uh, for the region. And thank you. Thank you, Lori. Very, very detailed and uh, extremely important to know. Uh, Alexandros. I'd like to ask you a question. First of all, if you can comment as well on what Lori said, given you, I'm sure you have plenty of comments, as well as uh, bringing up the topic of the US president, uh, you in your previous comments was talking about the fact that US needs to mediate. Now I wanted to ask you why specifically does the US need to mediate and not necessarily, for example, Germany, um, who has more closer ties to different countries within the region. Um, please, can you care to comment on that as well? Yes. Um... Firstly, on the points raised by both the ambassador and Lori, um, I would like to, uh, to agree with Lori that the East Med project does not have 
the the impact that Greece, uh, Cyprus, and Israel would want it to have. The the reason is is primarily financial and economical. There's there has been a lot of talk in Greece and Cyprus over the last ten years that you know the region will become a, a source of diversification away from Russian gas at the EU level, and the East Med gas pipeline would be uh, the the tool to do it. But if we look at the numbers, we expect that the U European Union will um, will need about 460 uh, billion cubic meters of natural gas from now until 2030. And then that demand will drop because of the, the strategy that the EU has to become carbon neutral by 2050. So uh, first, you know, the, the Russian gas dominates that market by providing roughly 40% of, 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 of those energy needs. So the East Med gas pipeline that will, you know, only provide 10 BCM per year will not be able to, to, to offer any true alternatives to that, uh, to that issue that the, that the EU has, which is the energy security issue. Furthermore, um, it doesn't seem like a prudent business move because right now, uh, you know, the gas prices within the EU are selling at $6 per million British thermal units. And we've seen that price go down as low as two dollars per million per, per MMBTU, but we expect that the market will will fluctuate between four and six dollars from now until 2030. The projections for the selling price of the East Med gas pipeline will be at nine dollars. So it, it 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 you know you know the East Med pipeline gas will have to compete at a much higher price than what the average price in the EU. Uh, is uh, right now and will be according to projections until 2030. Now, why the United States? Well, first and foremost, let's let's take take uh, Germany that that you've mentioned or the EU for that matter. The problem is that, and um, what we've seen last summer is that when the EU tried to play that mediative role, be, that role of mediation between the two sides, is that it seemed that it was leaving none of the two sides happy. The Greek, uh, the Greek government for its part believed that, you know, since Greece is an EU member state, it would expect a much tougher stance on Turkey from its, its own allies, uh, but it did not get that because the EU uh, has, with countries like Germany or Spain for that matter, have extensive financial links to Turkey and extensive trade links to Turkey that they would not want to dis that they would not want to disrupt because of adopting a tougher stance on uh, on uh, Turkey and at the same time given the current state of the, the Turkish economy that is is very close to a default it would mean that many European banks and especially Spanish banks and German banks and French banks especially Spanish banks which will you know, Spain is right now the, the fourth largest economy of the Eurozone. They are actually uh, in a very serious and grave position in the event of a Turkish default, which would mean that they will not get any of those billions of dollars and Turkish lira that they've invested in the uh, Turkish economy. So the EU does not have, in my, in my view, neither the, um, the will collectively, some members do, but nor the punch to actually uh, push Turkey uh, to the negotiating table with a much, um, much stronger uh, willingness from their part to solve those outstanding issues. At the same time, there has been uh, talk of NATO uh, playing that mediative role. During the height of the, the crisis, uh, uh, the general secretary of NATO tried to play that role, but it was essentially rejected from the Turkish side. Right now, there's another initiative coming, coming forth by him. But uh, it seems to me that uh, if, we'll, if history is, you know, is, is, is helping us in any way, the U.S. were the only party in previous crises, for example, in 1996 or in 1987 or even in 1974, which was the gravest crisis of all with the, with the Turkish invasion uh, in Cyprus, which essentially brought the two parties at war with each other, although none of them recognized that they, they fought each other uh, in 1974, um, shows that you know, the US is the only party that is able to, to, to hold uh, 
uh, uh, both sides accountable in some sense and actually bring them uh, to the table. Again, my, my, uh, my belief is that the Biden administration has not yet shown all of its cards, but it seems like it, it's holding a carrot and stick approach towards Turkey. For example, we had Antony Blinken uh, um, stating that uh, you know, they you should give incentives to Turkey to continue its, its accession process. But at the same time, we've seen that new sanctions have been imposed uh, on Turkey and there's not, not any willingness from the Biden administration to take those sanctions away. Actually, those sanctions were, you know, were pushed with overwhelming bipartisan support in the US Congress. So uh, it seems to me that, um, you know, the US has the capacity to uh, push uh, all sides within the region to, to dialogue. Now, obviously the US is not omnipotent in that respect. It, it has lost some of its clout, but at the same time, Again, my perception, especially when it comes to Greco Turkish relations, is that you know, the, the Cyprus problem is an easier way, is an easier problem to fix rather than the maritime disputes because a lot of substantial progress has been made and the two sides were very close to solution in 2017. So hopefully, uh, in April 27 and April 29th, when the five parties, um, Greece, Cyprus, the two, uh, sides on Cyprus, the Republic of Cyprus and the Turkish Cypriot community, along with the UK and the EU meet at Geneva to, to discuss whether there is, you know, any ground for the continuing, continuing negotiations um, from where they were left, on, left off in 2017. That is, I think, the best chance to act actually diffuse tensions for a long time in the Eastern Mediterranean. Thank you, Alexandros. Uh, now I'm pretty. I'm noticing the time, and uh, I'm going to ask the panelists just to leave the, uh, leave your answers short uh, going forward. Um, the ambassador, um, I'd like to give you the chance to comment uh, to what both Laurie and Alexandros were saying, as well as um, care to please just uh, highlight the importance of the new allies that Greece has has ventured on, given the rising tensions in the region. Uh, yes, thank you very much. No, I think uh, both Laurie and, uh, and um, Alex Ross have very valid points. I think for us, our position is very clear that we need to abide. It's not a question of resolution of, uh, of, new, of, uh, of uh, our differences. Is we need, both countries need to abide by international law. It's as simple as that, because this is the international law and the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea is the one that pre prevails throughout the world. There should be no exception for the Eastern Mediterranean. Why should there be any exception for it? Now, of course, the UNCLOS uh, provides also provisions for bilateral talks between countries, but the framework it is extremely clear. It is not, uh, we push our agendas as much as we can and we negotiate and threat. It's, you have, you have uh, certain principles, the principles of, uh, I, uh, the, in, the, in these principles, uh, islands have maritime zones, continental shelves, exclusive economic zones, and these need to be respected. They cannot be taken a la carte according to uh, what each country's was. So I think it's very important. I, it's very important that we all abide by international law. I mean, this is the general framework for, every, for everybody, and, and I don't see why it should be in any way different. And of course, we, can have, we, we need to have dialogue with Turkey on the delimitation of a maritime zone, an exclusive economic zone, but it, within this framework, not within another framework or within theories that are advanced that have no, no legal basis. I mean, this is, goes without saying. And, and regarding our new alliances, one point I would like to make clear from the beginning, our new alliances, um, they are at, they're, they've been done at the same time as there have be, be, been these important problems with Tur Turkey. But these new alliances are not turned against anybody, and they're not just because we all have problems with Turkey currently. These are strategic decisions, really strategic decisions for Greece. Greece wants to promote and, ha and have strategic relations with uh, all the countries. It's, it's always have, it has always been very close to Egypt, and it has become also very close to Israel. But uh, it, uh, the UAE and especially Saudi Arabia are very important partners from us. 
because they are central. Saudi Arabia is central in what's happening in the Gulf and between the Gulf and the Eastern Mediterranean. Well, it's the same sea. I mean, we go through the, 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 the Suez Canal, but it's exactly the same sea. So what concerns uh, Saudi and the Gulf concerns uh, uh, EU and Greece and the Eastern Mediterranean and vice versa. So, I mean, th this, is, this is very clear. And then we recently saw um, the Filia Forum, Filia Friendship Forum that took place in, in Greece on February 11, with the foreign ministers of um, Greece, Cyprus, Egypt, uh, France, uh, uh, and uh, UAE, and of course, Saudi Arabia. And there was a very important discussions and there were important achievements and decisions that have been taken. The, this is that the minister, they, they reiterate their commitment and adherence to international law and to UNCLOS. Um, they, they stressed our, their, our strong commitment to, fund, to fundamental principles, such as respect to sovereignty, sovereign rights, independence, and territorial integrity, uh, and peaceful resolution of differences, rejection of threats or of the use of force, so uh, freedom of navigation. These are very important principles. They need to be, everyone needs to follow them. And they also, uh, a, a, apart from this uh, political platform, it was also a very uh, sectorial economic platform because they, ex they expressed their, their readiness to promote result-oriented uh, uh, exchanges in energy, in innovation, in digital economy, in civil protection, people-to-people -people context in general and also in, in, in science, agricultural, uh, interfaith dialogue, culture, and sports. So this is a new format uh, that will be henceforth uh, referred to as the Filia Forum, uh, building friendship, peace, and pro prosperity from the Mediterranean to the Gulf. It has become effective, and it's uh, flexible and open to all countries of the regions uh, that share the same values and principles. So this is, has been a very important milestone and a very important achievement for Greece, um, the Filia Forum and the, a, a new regional platform. And uh, of course, you all, uh, all of you know that we are, uh, we are uh, having increasing military cooperation uh, with uh, the Egyptian Navy and with the UAE Air Force that took place in August of this year. And I'm very proud uh, to say that uh, Greece and Saudi Arabia are conducting the Falcon I-1 joint exercises of the Greek and the Saudi um, Air Forces. It has attracted a lot, a lot of attention from all sides, and uh, rightly so, because it's a very important uh, gesture and political message. Thank you very much. Thank you. As usual, I've been too long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Ambassador, on the contrary. Uh, now, I realize we have quite a few questions, so I'm just going to dive right in uh, from the audience. Uh, this is one from Michael Harari. Um, I'm going to quote exactly what he, what he said. Uh, this is for Lori. I suppose Lebanon's joining of the EMGF could contribute positively to its regional position and even improve its burgeoning cards vis-a-vis -vis the present negotiations with Israel. I'm aware, uh, of course, to the political complexity, but still, is it a development that we can speculate about? Yeah, so, uh, well, uh, you know, um, at least my interpretations at certain moment in time was when the French had this initiative and President Macron was in Beirut and uh, he had all this whole political initiative. My, my uh, thinking at that time was that if this French initiative succeed, was successful, and if, the, uh, if they were able to really uh, have this uh, political leverage in the country, uh, that would have pushed Lebanon to think at least to, to join the EMGF. And I think at one moment in time, Fr uh, France would have uh, suggested that to the Lebanese government and the Lebanese government could have contemplated it. Um, if, uh, now with the way we are going and with the clear uh, signal that the uh, that uh, um, part of, like let let's say clear like Hezbollah doesn't like to discuss politics internal politics with the French and they prefer directly to have this uh, uh, this thing with the, with the U.S. Uh, I think uh, it, it becomes more complicated. Uh, but what uh, so but what I think could be done? Uh, I think the East Med Gas Forum uh, should or could invite Lebanon to be an observer at the EMGF. 
So at least that there is a presence for Lebanon, even if it's not as a member, but at least as an observer, until the political situation uh, changes or shifts to another position where Lebanon could be, uh, uh, could, be uh, could, could contemplate seriously of joining the EMG, uh, the EMGF. So uh, I think like it is, it is very much uh, related to the internal political dynamics and who's controlling uh, the country currently. So, um, this is my, my, my answer to it. Definitely, there won't be, if, if, if Lebanon's oil and gas sector's development and the future will be very difficult without Lebanon entering the EMGF, the, the gas forum, because actually we do have like very, a very a complex relationship with Syria as well. So any gas that will be coming outside, out, out of Lebanon, and, and if we want to use the Arab gas pipeline, it's linked to Syria and to the situation in Syria. And if we don't want to use the Arab gas pipeline, we need another um, infrastructure. Uh, we'll be, we, we, are, we, we feel that Lebanon is becoming an island in the middle of the Arab world, if you want to say, with no, uh, with no network or no place to go for the oil and gas. So uh, a very, very, very difficult situation, but this comes with the un unstable political economic situation that Lebanon is in. Thank you very much, Lori. Um, Alexandros, uh, do you think that OPEC will play, this is from Visak Matthews, uh, do you think that OPEC will play any role in resolving this crisis? And will the Biden administration's climate change priorities play into this crisis that is primarily about the geopolitics between countries to get a bigger share of fossil fuel reserves? Well, um, on the first part of the question, I don't think that OPEC, as as OPEC can actually play play any, any role because, you know, as, as you know much much better than I do, uh, OPEC does not have, uh, you know, um, has, you know, it's primarily an oil uh, an oil exporting group. Although natural gas plays uh, a part of it in the Eastern Mediterranean, we're primarily looking at natural gas. But also, I've, to me, there's there's too much conflict within OPEC's members to actually play a role on that. And at the same time, I don't see that the region's actual reserves, um, you know, that are at the, at the level uh, that would get OPEC uh, very much interested in, uh, in, in, those, in those actual reserves. So I don't think that OPEC will, will actually play a part in solving the crisis. Now on the second question, obviously, uh, President Biden has that huge agenda when it comes to climate change, which is obviously a, a, a huge um, differentiation uh, compared to the Trump administration. But at the same time, um, natural gas is one of those uh, fossil fuels that will be from, from you know, they will play a huge part in uh, the transition to a green economy. A green economy cannot happen overnight. And uh, natural gas is seen as one of those uh, one of those transition fuels. Now, what is more important, and I think Lori has has actually uh, said a lot about this already, and we have to keep that in mind. It, it it is about the geopolitics. But if we look at the the European market, what I was trying to say before with the Eastmed gas pipeline, I think that Eastmed gas will play a much more important role if it's used regionally rather than trying to be exported. Especially as a as a as a gas uh, as a, ga a pipe gas rather than LNG. I mean, LNG gives you other export options, but you know the the countries within the uh, Eastern Mediterranean basin they are they will be using uh, there there you know there's a, there's huge needs for um, for natural gas. So I think uh, if natural gas can become a vehicle for solving some of the, the disputes. I think the Biden administration would um, we would we would welcome it, uh, irrespective of its of its green uh, green policy agenda. Thank you, Alexandros. Now I noticed there's ten minutes left, uh, so I'm gonna basically ask the three of you each a question, and uh, then you can continue on. So I don't have to stop and go back and forth. Uh, I'll start with Ambassador. This is a question to you from an anonymous attendee. Uh, what is the Greek position on the Montreux Convention regarding the regime of the Straits? And how do Russian interests in unencumbered access to and from the Black Sea 
via the Bosphorus Straits to the rest of the world align with Greek interests in the region. Um, to Lori, I will ask you, um, what are the prerequisites basically for Lebanon and Israel to narrow their differences over the delimitation of their common maritime boundary uh, coming at a period of the fourth round of talks before halting the fifth round in December? Is American mediation still the most preferred option for Lebanon? And finally, Alexandros, um, regarding the East Mediterranean Gas Forum, do you think uh, how much is uh, the projected value of these reserves and does it warrant uh, such long-winded negotiations? Ambassador, you are set to go. Thank you. This is a very central question on the Montreux Convention. I don't think I have anything to add there. I mean, this is a, a convention that has, it's an international convention. It, it, uh, it goes uh, beyond borders and beyond uh, um, positions of uh, different member states. I think uh, to assure freedom of navigation uh, throughout these straits is extremely important. It needs to be ensured. These types of uh, conventions and these types of freedom, they cannot be held hostage to any kind of uh, uh, positions or any kind of uh, actions or claims, or it's very clear this has been the case since the beginning, and this is something that uh, doesn't need to change. So, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, you know, the Black Sea is also a big issue, and there are also a lot no, as in the Eastern Mediterranean, they're also in the Black Sea, there are also issues that need to be resolved. So, I mean, it's, it's one the same, but the principle, the basis, the same. Abidance by the international laws, abidance by the international, the, the international law of the sea, and uh, this is the only way forward. And uh, not any, any kind of other arrangement or any kind of other claim. I don't, there is no reason. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Laurie, please go ahead. Uh, yes, so I'll be very brief because I can take a one, a one whole hour discussing this the, this um, <laughs> this issue about the delimitation. So please I guess do. One, yeah, so it's very quick. So the issue now, it's just on the Tehelet effect. So Tehelet is one, one rock, one kilometer away from the Israeli shore. And the difference is like, should Tehelet be given a full effect in the delimitation or zero effect. Lebanon considers that Tehelet should be given zero effect because a full effect is distorting the whole uh, the, uh, the equidistant line and it is not an equitable solution. Israel is insisting on giving it a full effect. So this is the only disagreement currently that we have. And when they come back to the negotiations, this is, this is what it should be uh, discussed. Uh, and hopefully that the U.S. mediator will understand that this is where the discussions would happen. The U, uh, hopefully the Israelis will take this opportunity that, to discuss this matter because this is the real matter and nothing else uh, matters on that. Uh, is the U.S. mediator uh, relevant or not relevant? It's the only option that we have. Like we know that the Israelis don't like to go to international courts or arbitration or whatever. So it's the only way. It's either U.S. mediation or direct negotiations. Since we cannot have direct negotiations, the U.S. is the only option for us. So hopefully that the U.S. will be playing the real mediator's role and not be biased. You know, like the perception in the country is that the U.S. is always biased to Israel as, as part of their uh, grand politics, right? It, it's not personal against Lebanon or, or uh, for this mediation. So uh, we have to take that into account. And uh, Lebanon should be uh, more assertive in explaining its position uh, on this uh, medita mediation and the, the line that Lebanon is proposing as the line that should be the starting point for negotiations. In brief, and thank you, Tarek, for this opportunity because I think I need to. Uh, these are my last words. So thank you for this opportunity and for Arab news. And hopefully, we'll have other issues to discuss. The East Mediterranean is very exciting. It's very sexy. Everybody wants to talk about it. So I'm sure we'll be having uh, other sessions for that. So thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Alex, as well. I really enjoyed the discussion, and thank you for everyone that is following us on social media. Thank you very much, Lori, for your very kind words and for your insightful uh, commentary. Alexandros, wrap uh, us up, no, please. Um, on the question, on the projected value, I don't really have a number right now, but what I can say is that uh, given the, um, you know, the, the gas reserves that have been uh, proven, uh, they, uh, you know, they're only a fraction of the world uh, known gas reserves. So, 
in in one sense, um, I think the person that's asking this question has has some uh, right in saying that you know these negotiations or these climate, you know, does it really worth it? But the question is the the reality is that uh, you know hydrocarbons came on top of already ongoing and you know decade long issues among actors. So. Uh, hydrocarbons at one point seemed like the solution and might hopefully be the solution to many of these conflicts and issues. But at, the, at, the, at this point in time, it just became another source of friction along a long list of other points of friction between um, either Greeks and Turks or between uh, Israelis and, and Arabs and Lebanese. And um, uh, to me, it seems that, you know, the reality is that you cannot take the economics out of politics and the politics out of the economics. So unless unless there is a way that both can be can be mixed in order to find viable solutions to to most of these problems, hydrocarbons within the region will not be uh, you know will not be fully exploited. I mean, to give you an example, uh, a couple of years ago and a year ago we had big um, big oil firms like Eni, for example looking at and researching for gas in uh, the, the Cypriot exclusive economic zone. But because of the ongoing dispute between Greece, Cyprus and Turkey, uh, those, those drill ships were not able to fully conduct their operations. In that respect, there might be more gas that hasn't been found already that we're not able to actually locate it and exploit it because of all of these political uh, differences. So my, you know, my last point would be that unless you find a way to make hydrocarbons uh, a point of cooperation rather than, rather than a point of contestation, you will not be able to have uh, any fruitful hydrocarbon exploitation in the Eastern Mediterranean. And since this was my last word, I would also like to thank you for having me here and for uh, the excellent panelists and the people that have been uh, looking uh, at us via social media. Thank you all. Yes, uh, Basil, you want to say something? Yes, Tarek, thank you. I would like also um, my final word, thank you. Thank uh, Alexandros and Lori and all our viewers for uh, following this discussion. Uh, I thought it was very insightful, very useful. I, I enjoyed a lot of the expertise of all the, of, all the, of uh, Lori and Alexandros. I think there's a lot to say on East Mediterranean and uh, I'm sure it's going to, it's, it is a matter that interests a lot of people. Uh, not only in Greece or in the Eastern Mediterranean, but also in the Gulf. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, what a star-studded panel lineup, lineup of panelists, indeed. And thank you all of uh, all of you who have been uh, tuning in via either Twitter, YouTube, or registered for this webinar. Please do follow Arab News Research and Studies for further webinars on a range of topics. And I hope to see you all again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you.